So I don't have all the pretty pictures of the surface of the Earth, but I'm going to show you what I hope you think are some pretty pictures of the inside of the Earth, which is the point of doing US Array in the first place. Um, since US Array has just arrived here in the East Coast, we don't have a lot of those pretty pictures, so I'm going to instead show you some of the uh, ones we've taken from the Pacific Northwest and the Western US. Um, and then I'll give you a little taste of, I think, what's going to maybe emerge as we move into the East Coast. One thing that you'll notice just from any of these colored maps, um, this is a beautiful example where you see all these sutured terrains um, stitched together. And one of the great things about seismology is we can actually image the transitions between these. And so you'll see many examples of that as I um, move through a few of the slides. I want to just step back for a second. Hopefully all of you have heard of plate tectonics. And if you haven't, then that's a separate conversation for uh, beers. But one of the things that um, I want to make sure everyone's thinking about is the simple fact that we have kind of three um, main regions of plate boundaries. We've got spreading centers, and we've seen a lot of examples of that. Wilson cycles, where you have spreading and, and uh, convergence. Uh, subduction zones, like in the western US, where the Juan de Fuca plate is diving beneath the North American plate, creating the Cascades. Uh, and we also have things like plumes, or at least hot spots. Um, places like Hawaii are a great example of that. But a lot of the debate actually is what happens kind of in these depths. These are not to scale, but say, let's just call that 100 kilometers. We don't know if mantle plumes come from the core mantle boundary. We don't know exactly how hot spots are generated. And by the same token, we don't know what happens to these plates, what the fate of a plate is as we move into the deeper mantle. And so one of the great things about US Array is we can actually start to image those many hundreds of kilometers deep. Um, if you're an astrophysicist, then what you would do is say, OK, I want to set, set up a big experiment with a bunch of um, radio telescopes in this case. And I want to point that telescope at different areas and focus on specific details of various um, galaxies or other solar systems. And so uh, who has been to the VLA, the Very Large Array, in New Mexico? OK. Well, if you haven't, but you've seen the hit movie Contact with Jodie Foster, you know that she's sitting out on her station wagon listening in headphones at one of these telescopes. That's exactly what uh, astrophysicists do. They just listen on headphones for these signals. Now, actually, what they do is they, they they take these um, configurations of these arrays, and you can actually see these are railroad tracks that go way out into the desert. And so depending on what they're focused on, these radio telescopes can be expanded or contracted and, and uh, configured in different ways. And so what we do with Earth to image the interior is the same sort of thing. We set up arrays of seismometers, and we listen for earthquakes from all over the world in this case. OK, and so US Array, you've seen many different maps. So just to put this in perspective, um, in 2001, this is the uh, first year as a professor at Arizona State. This is what the state of North America looked like. We had lots and lots of seismic experiments going on in the um, western US. And uh, many areas of, say, around Yellowstone, you can see many of these other lines are seismic networks that were put in by individual PIs or groups of PIs, that is, groups of scientists. But there wasn't a major effort. Um, so a, a lot of these sort of um, produced some phenomenal results. But you can see even these really tightly spaced lines of seismometers can only focus on specific details for one specific area. Um, for graduate school, I actually helped build this line. And so we found a lot of interesting things, but we had no context. We didn't know how that related to the rest of the continent. So fast forward 10 years, and here's a snapshot. Now this is, it's weird, it's, ten, it's two years ago, 2011. This is what uh, the, the um, occupation of uh, the US has looked like now. And since then, um, any of those updated status maps, now we know that US Array is already making its way up the eastern seaboard. And so the really exciting thing that's going to happen and that I've been showing this particular slide for a while, and it's weird to think that now it's actually 2013. This is you know, far out in the future. We would actually have these images of the East Coast. But in fact, by the end of this year, US Array will be occupying all the eastern seaboard and parts of southern Canada. OK, you've probably seen one of these maps. This is the old uh, uh, deployment map showing the sectors of US Array as it marched 400 stations a at a time. Um, I think Patrick's going to show a few more slides on the, on the actual deployment, but just to show you quickly 
Um, these individual stations are uh, six foot holes that are dug with a backhoe, and I guess we'll see a piece of that. Is that right, Steve? Well, we'll see the we'll see the cylinder. Okay. Okay. Um, and so these are dug down in the ground. They pour concrete down in the bottom. They're completely waterproof, and then they build these shelves of electronics to. Um, take care of all the data logging and digitizing, so the recording of the data. And down in the bottom of this uh, particular inst uh, station is the actual seismometer. It weighs about 20 pounds. It's incredibly um, sensitive. And about 25 years ago, these were developed, and it was a revolution in how we do our portable, what we call portable broadband seismology. So when everything's done, uh, built out, they pile a big pile of dirt on it and set up a solar panel. There's also some communications as well. So the footprint of one of these US array stations is pretty small. It only takes about uh, 15 feet by 15 feet or so. Um, and the main thing, really the only thing sticking out is the power system and the communications unless you have uh, no, I unless you can't do um, communications uh, other than what's called a VSAT, which is a big satellite dish. And then you have to have this huge bank of batteries and it gets really expensive and, and it's just messy. So hopefully we don't have to do that in the eastern seaboard. So the other part of US Array, that's called the transportable array. There's also the flexible array. And that's where individual groups go out and propose to have a focused study somewhere that ideally sort of overlaps with where the transportable array is, is located. And so these are, um, uh, dug, these are stations dug by hand, not by a backhoe. Um, and it's usually a group of professors and graduate students that put these together. And so you can see a, 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 one of those stations is a little bit smaller in footprint, but it's the same idea. You've got a hole with the data logger and digitizer outside and a solar panel. Uh, this is what's called a, a huddle test. This is um, just to make sure that all of the instruments are working. And uh, there's another piece of that. This is what we call natural source. That's just waiting for earthquakes to happen. Uh, there's also a so-called control source where you set up these very dense lines and then you blow stuff up. So we actually would call that explosion source, except that that doesn't sound very good when you're trying to get permits. So you, sound, you make it sound like you actually you know, have some sort of control over it. <laughs> Usually that's true. Um, what's happened in terms of flex array experiments, this is the uh, number of them. And uh, it would take the rest of the talk to go through all the acronyms, but seismologists love acronyms. So you can actually look all these up. I'll just, men yeah, and we'll talk about a couple like Sesame. We won't talk about OINK. I'll just point out the only one on here, it's one um, that I'll show you a little more example of, is HLP, which is, just stands for High Lava Plains. We didn't try to get cute with trying to make up a name. We just. So what I want to do is just show you some snippets of some examples of the power of US Array and what we can do with broadband seismology. And what we usually do is try to image the Earth's crust and upper mantle and relate that to what we see at the surface in terms of the, the geology. So you've seen some very nice geologic uh, talks about the eastern seaboard in the last um, several talks. And so uh, what I'll show you here is just some uh, results that we have from the Pacific Northwest. The Pacific Northwest is a pretty amazing place. In the last 20 million years, it's had more, sorry, the last 50 million years, it's had more volcanism than anywhere else on um, the continent. And one of the really interesting parts of that are this entire, what looks like a spray of volcanism over the last 20 million years. Now these colors represent different compositions of, of the volcanic rocks, just based on their silica content, and the strength of the color uh, shows their age. And so just to sort of draw out a couple of important points, um, the two main ones that we really know about are these time progressive volcanics from the Snake River Plains into Yellowstone. So I know about 17 million years ago, something happened around here at the Idaho, Oregon, Nevada border. And one hotspot tract migrated to the northeast, landing at present day Yellowstone. Uh, a sister to that is actually the High Lava Plains tract, which looks more like a wave of volcanism of similar composition and similar ages moving to the northwest. And that culminates to the east of the present day Cascades um, range uh, around new the Newberry hotspot. So we don't actually know why this occurred. Sta the standard model is that this is a plume, a deep mantle plume, hit the surface, warmed up the crust, allowed melting, and as the plate dragged over that hotspot, you generate this hotspot volcanism. 
High Lava Plains doesn't fit that simple model. And so there's something much more complicated going on than just a simple mantle plume. Um, in a separate talk, I could go into the details of why uh, we think there's actually a, a range of things that um, argue against a deep mantle plume. I just want to briefly go in here and show you some of these. Uh, this is a high lava plains outpouring called Diamond Craters. This is about a thousand years old. So imagine just driving out in the middle of, well, nowhere in Oregon, and all of a sudden you see things like Jordan Craters, um, Diamond Craters, and you move into Idaho. Who's been to Craters of the Moon? Okay. You're driving over that hill. If you come on, come on the back side of, of uh, I think it's Highway 55, you go through Fairfield, and then you dip down into the valley, and it, it looks like Hawaii. And you're right in the middle of uh, um, some wheat fields and probably some soybeans. OK, and then present day Yellowstone isn't quite as remarkable, but we know that's a massive caldera. OK, so uh, what we did was actually set up a seismic experiment um, embedded in U.S. Array to image the details of the high lava plains area. So the white triangles are the U.S. Array stations. The red inverted triangles are some other stations nearby. And then the blue inverted triangles are the 118 stations that we installed over a couple of year period. So these were all dug by hand, um, involved probably 250,000 miles of driving by the time we dug everything and came back and serviced everything. Embedded within that, we also had a controlled source line from Newberry into Idaho and another one from sort of central Oregon down. So just to put, the, put this in perspective, here's Idaho, here's Oregon, here's Nevada, and here's northernmost California. So we're, we're really trying to link the geology of the high lava plains with the deeper structure. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here. One thing is that geophysicists love colors. So as you see the colors emerge from different plots within the eastern US, um, make sure you look at the scale bar because they, these colors may look very similar, but they're for very different measurements. This is an example of seismic wave speeds. And so the way to interpret an image like this is that the red areas are hotter and the blue areas are colder. In the crust, um, these are areas that, uh, these are the hottest areas are places like Yellowstone and Newberry. And as you go deeper, you can still see Yellowstone and Newberry. Um, as you go into uh, the high lava plains, now this is a different set of colors. We're, we're just looking at boundaries. So these are cross sections now. Here's a west-east cross section across the high lava plains. And this blue area is where we see the moho, that is the crust mantle boundary. And one of the really interesting things is that we see a big step as you go from the young high lava plains into the old part of the Idaho batholith. Within the crust, we also see these red zones, which we interpret as low velocity zones, we think are actually little bits of partial melt. And it turns out that we see the partial melt where we don't see the volcanism. We think the volcanism is actually where the melt has drained. And these are areas where the melt hasn't been allowed to drain. When we go to a broader scale, now this is a seismic tomography image at 125 kilometers depth. One of the really interesting things is the whole Snake River Plain and Yellowstone area is really red, really hot. That's what we'd expect, except that that's much deeper and much more extensive than just the Yellowstone area, which was the major surprise. It's this entire area. But when you look at where all the recent volcanism is, these are volcanoes that erupted in the last 11,000 years or less. That co-locates quite nicely. So it's not just Yellowstone, but Craters of the Moon. And there's three other volcanic centers. OK, I'm also going to jump into the Great Basin quickly. And I'm going to skip straight to this slide. This is a compilation of a lot of measurements. Um, but we took a, some, uh, we looked at the volcanism of the area. Actually, there's very little in the last 10 million years. We looked at heat flow and the seismic structure. This is actually an image of the of volume of seismic structure. And we think we found a place where the plate is actually dripping off. The base, of the, the base of the plate. That's a bit controversial, but, controversial, but it actually explains a lot of, of uh, related structures. OK, so I just want to highlight quickly a couple of the flex array deployments as we move into the um, last phase of US Array. One of them is uh, SESAME. Again, we have to have the acronyms, so I won't read through all these. This is run by Brown University, UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, Georgia. 
This is a series of transects. Again, these will be embedded within US Array, but very dense station spacing to get at some of the um, detailed structure. Here's an example trying to get across the Piedmont and Carolina trains, as well as the Sewanee suture. And so really trying to nail down the, the structure of the uh, interior of the crust and the mantle as well. And these are only successful because they can put in those very dense lines, but also look at the background um, US Array data. Tina is another example. This is just a, an, a, a test experiment in Virginia. And I'll show you a quick result. These are just for a few stations. Basically, this is uh, crustal thicknesses. This is from Maggie Benoit going from thin, sort of 30 kilometer thick crust to 50 kilometers thick crust as you get into the interior of the Appalachian terrain. And what's really nice is if you start to put this in context, which we will be able to in about a year with the rest of US Array, we'll see just how different those structures are as you move from the coast into the interior. OK, and then finally, I'll just, just say that as these stations are deployed in this last year, there's a big push by the US Geological Survey to try and keep some of these stations um, near critical facilities for a longer period of time. So critical facilities like nuclear power plants and other places. And so what we hope is, while the rest of US Array has sort of been removed, that up to about one in four of these seismic stations may stay in a much longer time period. Uh, it doesn't look like there's full funding for that yet, but you, I think we can hope that there will be somewhere between maybe 50 and 100 stations remaining from this final grid. So that's something to look for in the next year or so. Thanks. Thank you.